So I hope uh, I'll, I'm hoping I'm able to share that as well. Okay. So as we do every week, we're going to be focusing on a sugya topic in halacha that relates to this week's sedra, this week's parsha, and actually this week we are going to be touching upon something contemporary halacha, as was advertised. Right. So this time it's going to be fitting a little bit more to the contemporary. Now. Uh, today's share is going to, the topic is going to be Malachas Mavir, the Malacha on Shabbos, the work that we're not allowed to do, the work of burning, of making a fire. Today's share is based on the Kutasikhas Chelak Lamad Vav, volume 36. Now, we know that there are 39 Malachas, 39 forms of work that we're not allowed to do on Shabbos, they're prohibited on Shabbos. From all the 39 forms of work, there's only one that's explicit in the Torah. And that is in this week's parsha, where it says, <laughs> Clearly in the Torah, there's only one, and that is the prohibition of burning, of making a fire. Now, what constitutes burning? In other words, what is the definition of this malach, of this work of burning? And it's a very important question, because every one of each one of the 39 malachas have also what we call tuldas sort of uh, children, told us literally means children, but it means sort of subcategories that come from them. So if you have to understand the malacha well in order to understand what would be a derivative from that, that malacha, that form of work. So today we're going to be speaking about two different ways of understanding what essentially is the form of work that we call burning, ma'avir. Ma'avir is referring to the person or havara, same thing, havara, to burn. So we start, we begin with the Rambam, as we've done many times. The Rambam says like this, it's the 12th parak of the laws of Shabbos, and here's where he speaks about burning. Hamavir kol shuchayev, someone who kindles, how much you have to kindle, how much fire, how, well, how large is the flame, makes no difference. Even the smallest fire, chayev is liable. However, here comes the caveat. The caveat is, Buhu la'efer. He's only liable if he makes a fire because he needs ashes. Let me let me translate that a little differently because you might say, oh, who makes a fire for ashes? So obviously someone can make a fire for ashes, but also what does that mean practically? It means that there has to be some sort of productivity to the fire. That's what the Rambam wants us to know right away, that it cannot be a fire that's destructive. A fire that's purely destructive is actually not something that a person would be liable to for on Shabbos. Now, let me be clear. It would be forbidden. It's asur, but not chayav. That's the, the expression that we're going to see is pater aval asur. You're not liable, but you, but it is forbidden. So he says you need ashes. There, this fire has to be productive for a productive purpose, productive intent. Aval, however, im hiver der if he if he kindled the fire with this destructive intent, then pater. Because all he's doing is he's causing ruin. And then he continues, he says, however, there is one form or a few forms of destructive destruction that actually is constructive in a negative way. What is that? He says, someone who burns, he sets fire to his friend's storage of fruit or a grain. Oh yeah, he burns his friend's house. Use the word friend, right? Uh, with friends like these, <laughs> who needs enemies, as they say. She says, Oh, yeah, say if the Rosh, but if he's burning his friend's home, Chayev, he's liable. Even though he is destroying. Again, we just now said the fire has to be productive. But yet, if you're destroying somebody else's home, unfortunately, it is constructive. Why is it constructive? For your Yetzirah, it's constructive. The Yetzirah feels good about it. It's a strange thing, right? In other words, it's destructive. Clearly, you're destroying somebody else's property, but there is a constructive element because you, you're calm down. It cools you down when a person lets out their anger like that. He's trying to take revenge. So the Ramam says there are other such examples of a situation where a person is really doing something destructive, but there's a, an element of being constructive to it. 
let's not get caught up in this example. The point is that the Rambam says that you have to, in making a fire, the tenai, the condition is that in order for this fire to be, the person should be liable on Shabbos for the malacha of burning, they have to make the fire that is productive. They have to kindle a fire for a productive intent. Now for the, that reading in the Rambam that we just read, based on that reading, the famous Avne Nezer, Avne Nezer was the, the first Sachachava Rebbe, the Rebbe of Sachachav. So he wrote a beautiful sefer called Avne Nezer, very deep sefer, very power, very strong sefer, meaning strong in halacha. And he writes based on this, something very interesting. He says, What is the definition, the essential definition of this melacha, of this form of work that's forbidden on Shabbos called burning? The definition is consuming wood. Burning and consuming coal. The consumption of matter, you know, of something material things, that is what fire means. That's what burning means. That's what the Isra on Shabbos is. The Isra of Shabbos, what do you want? You want to, you know, take it down to the bone, right? What is this prohibition? You're not allowed to make a fire. You're not allowed to kindle a fire. It means you're not allowed to make cause for wood to be consumed, for items to be consumed, to be burnt. That's the definition of burning. He reads it in the Rambam, right? The Rambam says, you Hamavir kol shuhu, you make a fire, your chayiv, v'hu, but a condition that you need the ashes. Meaning, why is that the condition? That's the condition because that's the definition of what burning is. However, the Balatanya and Shulchan Aruch Harav, he understands it differently. He says, no, the Rambam, if you understand the Rambam correctly, you'll understand as follows, that Inyan Ha'avara, the idea of burning this uh, the definition it's not about the consumption of the wood it's about the enlargement of the flame okay so now if you're with me there's two things here every time there's a fire burning there's two things happening something is being consumed and a, and a flame is burning which one of these is the essence of this malach of this work and I, as i said earlier it's an important question because based on that, you can understand what to derive from this malacha. So the Avne Nezer said, reads the Rambam. He says, well, to me, it seems clear in the Rambam that it is the consumption of the wood. Shulchan Aruch Harav says, no, it's the existence or the production or enlargement of a flame, the flame itself. He uses a few more words to explain this in his Kuntras Achren, which is in the Shulchan Aruch. He says as follows, Although we just learned in the Rambam that you're only liable if you need ashes, it has to be productive. He says, Nevertheless, the main obligation, the main liability, it's not because of the consumption and destruction of the wood, because you enlarge the flame. That's the prohibition. The prohibition is not to enlarge a flame, not to cause a flame to be enlarged. So again, the Balatanya focuses on the flame itself. The Abninezer focuses on the consumption of the wood or the wick or whatever is being consumed. And basically what the Balatanya is saying is the fact that the that it has to be productive, it has to produce ashes, that's, that's like a side tonight. That's like a side condition but it's not the definition of the malacha of the work itself and of the prohibition. Now, the Balatanya continues to prove his point that it's about the enlargement of the fire and not about the consumption of the wood. He says, look further in the Rambam itself. The Rambam continues in that halacha that we quoted earlier to say as follows. Someone who makes a fire, he lights a candle. He doesn't need ashes. He doesn't need oil. He does, meaning oil like for the wax to melt or something like that. He doesn't need ashes that come from the fire. All he needs is warmth or he needs light. So what does he say in the Rambam? 
he's liable. Meaning that the definition of, of burning is even when you're not looking for ashes. When you're not trying to burn something, you're trying to get something out of the flame itself. And then he continues and he brings perhaps the greatest example of this idea of that the prohibition is in the flame itself and not so much in the consumption of the wood. He says, someone who heats up iron in order to uh, put it later in cold water, in other words, to, to, to shape it in the water, that is a derivative of this malacha. Think about it. When you we're talking about, he, he, there's a fire burning already. Okay, there's a fire burning for whatever reason, a stove or there's a someone is lighting a candle. And all the person did was brought metal, brought iron to the flame and now started bending it. That is um, part of the definition of this malach of this work. You see, you didn't do anything to, to cause for the destruction or the consumption of wood or the wick. All you did was you added heat. That is the problem. This is all part of the Balatanian's proof. Now, I don't know. I think Robin is on the is on with us, but uh, yeah, I think so. Either way, last week she, I mentioned the Ragachover, and that was after the class we spoke about the Ragachover. So I want to quote from him again this week. The Ragachover, the Ragachover Goin, as I said last week, he's the Robin Dvinsk at the same time as the Ursameach. So he wrote fascinating and very, very deep svarim on the Rambam that are called Safnas Paneach. And on Safran Spaneach, he actually addresses this point and these two ways of understanding the Rambam, right? As of now, we have two ways of understanding it. Is it that it's um, the, the problem of burning or that the definition of burning is the consumption of the wood or the definition of burning is the enlargement of the flame? So he says, I have a proof that it is the enlargement of the flame itself. What's the proof? Very interesting proof. He says, read the words in the Rambam. Which words? The very beginning. A mavir kol shuchayev. Someone who kindles even the smallest fire is liable. If the definition of burning is the consumption of the wood or the destruction of the wood, then you would not be liable for the smallest flame. Depends what you're burning. If it's wood, then it has to be this amount. If it's wick, it has to be that amount. Everything you're going to burn is going to have a different level of productivity, a different level of consumption a different level, different level of destruction. Whereas the fact that the halacha is that burning, it makes no difference how much, but even the smallest flame is high of, is liable, says the Rogachavar, says the in Safran Spaneach, he says that's the proof that the fire is the determined. It's the, what determines this halacha, this malacha, this work, what constitutes burning. It's not what you're destroying, but rather... The flame itself is the problem. That's why even the smallest flame will be a liability, will be liable, regardless of what you're burning. That was his, um, that's his proof. Now, the problem with this is that it leaves us with a question. Why is the very first halacha that the Rambam brings, the very first example, exhibit A, for this malacha of burning, is a situation where a person needs the ashes. You see, according to the opinion that reads in the Rambam, that the destruction of the wood, the consumption of the, of the wood or whatever, the wick, that is the definition of burning. Then we understand why exhibit A in the Rambam, the first example that he would bring right off the bat, is if you're burning for the purpose of ashes. However, now that we see that there's a lot of reason to say there's a, that the Rambam is actually not saying that. The Rambam is saying that Hamavir Koshu, even a little bit, it's all about the flame itself. That's the prohibition. It's not about what you're producing or what you're destroying. Why is Exhibit A in the Rambam, the first example that he brings about someone who needs ashes? What should have been the first example? The first example should have been if you needed heat, if you want warmth or light. That's a good example because that's an example where you're using the flame itself as you know as, as a productivity. In this case, he's looking, you know, the first example that he brings is a case where you're not you don't need the flame, you need the results, the byproduct of the wood that comes out of the flame. 
So why would that be his first example if the definition of burning is not about what, what it produces, is not about what it consumes? I'm going to explain the question and really point out how there is a simple answer to this question. Simple answer is that the Rambam is trying to, right off the bat, start with a situation, a case. He wants to um, illustrate a case where it is there is absolutely no um, destructive intent in the burning. Because if you think about it, when let's say someone burns a piece of wood because they want warmth, really they're destroying for the purpose of warmth. There is destruction there. However, if you're burning for the purpose of ashes, there's no destruction. You're actually you're creating the ashes while it's burning. It's 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 completely constructive in your intent. You're not you see when when you when you light firewood for warmth, there's a little bit of a give and take there. You know, I'm taking heat, but I have to give because in a few minutes the fire whatever a few hours the wood is going to burn up and then I'm going to need more. So it's there's a little bit of destruction there for the purpose of the construct the being constructive. But if you're burning wood for the purpose of ashes then it is 100% constructive. So you would say that the Rambam wants to start with a case where it's not destructive or rather constructive. Now, it's a good, okay, so that's a clear answer. However, again, we're still left trying to understand why is it that the Rambam does not start his halachas with a situation and a case where a person is using a fire for the sake of the fire itself, which is the definition of burning where the flame itself is what you need. Okay, now if I got, if I, if I was too confusing, I'm sorry, I want to summarize my point up until this, up until where we're holding. So if I was uh, confusing until this point, forgive me, because right now I'm about to put it all together, hopefully. And that is, based on the simple reading of the Rambam, the Rambam, then it's clear why he starts off with giving a situation, a case where a person is burning for the purpose of ashes, that is his primary case that is forbidden on Shabbos. But even according to the other opinion that says, and this is going to be my punchline, that says that the definition of burning according to the Rambam is the flame itself, not what is being consumed. Even that opinion reads the Rambam and says that the ultimate fire, the ultimate Melacha of burning is not only when you want the flame itself, but also when you want the byproduct of the wood, the ashes. There's the definition of the of the melacha, definition of the work, and that is the enlarging a flame, the need for the flame itself. But then there's the ultimate flame, and the ultimate flame is a flame where you also have purpose in what is being consumed. That's what it seems from the Rambam, because he starts up speaking about burning and he immediately wants us to know that the ultimate form of burning is when there's a need in the ashes okay so what am i saying what am i trying to say where am i getting what am i getting at so for this we have to do what we do every week which is to go a little deeper into the halacha understand that this halacha is not only talking about shabbos it's talking about every day of the week and it's not only talking about burning a fire on shabbos it's talking about burning a different fire altogether. In other words, the primis, the so the nefesh, the nesham of this halacha is talking about way beyond the laws of Shabbos. But I have to make the following introductory point. You know, many people ask, you may have had this question yourself, or maybe people ask you this question. I get asked this question a lot. Who decided what is forbidden on Shabbos? Who decided? And a lot of people have this notion that it was completely invented by sages throughout the generations. And they say, oh, why can't I do this on Shabbos? Why can't I do that? Come on, it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah. I can't. All it says in the Torah is now let's do work. Who, who are you to tell me what is work? Maybe, maybe walking to Shul is more work than driving, you know, things like that. So the truth is, the Torah does tell us what work means. Because the Torah tells us in this week's parsha, you're not allowed to do work on Shabbos. And immediately afterwards, it starts speaking about a different type of work. It uses the word melacha in the context of the of all the things that were needed in the Mishkan. From there, we learn that all forms of work that were used in the Mishkan 
That's the definition of work that's forbidden on Shabbat. That's where the number 39 comes. The 39 different forms of work that were used in the Mishkan, it is those 39 forms of work that are forbidden to be done on Shabbos with all their der derivatives. What does that mean? That means that although the 39 forms of work are things that are forbidden on Shabbos, these forms of work have a holy source. What's the holy source? The Mishkan. These were all used to serve Hashem. These, this is where the Torah defines serving Hashem with these 39 forms of work. And the same would apply to the details. And here's an important point. The details. When the when Shulchan Aruch or the Rambam or the Gemara tells us that this is called work on Shabbos, this is not called work on Shabbos, it is teaching us about serving Hashem. And it's telling us, you want to know what it means to serve Hashem, to do our work, so to say, for Hashem? Then look at the laws of Shabbos. What is considered a work on Shabbos, that's considered a form of serving Hashem in, spirit, in a spiritual holy form. What's not considered work on Shabbos is not considered serving Hashem in a, in a holy spiritual form. So now, basically, what we're up to now is to try to understand what does it mean to burn on Shabbos, what does it mean to burn in serving Hashem? And what does it mean to make ashes in serving Hashem? The, the Pasuk says in Mishle, Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The Neshama of a man is considered Ner Hashem, Hashem's candle, Hashem's flame. It's a beautiful statement, right? I mean, what, is it, what is it? the Neshama is a flame of God. What does that mean? Practically, what does that mean? What does it mean the Neshama is a flame? Sounds like an inspirational, motivational thing, but what, what really does it mean? So the, the Balatanya writes in Tanya, he says that actually, if you think about the science of a flame, that is the science of your neshama. What does that mean? So I'll read it inside, but let me first explain it outside and then I, I could read it and translate it. He says, everything in this world, everything wants to go down. You throw up a ball, it goes down. You hold a cup, it goes down. Everything goes down. Water goes down. Earth goes down. Even wind doesn't go necessarily down, but it doesn't go up. Fire is the only thing that always wants to go up. It's always flickering to go up. And where's it going? It wants to go back to its source, to its spiritual source. When you look at a flame, what you're looking at is something that's saying, please, please get me out of here. We have to come up with all forms of re ways of trying to, to, to schlep it down. We take a wick, you take oil, whatever you need. These are all forms of keeping the flame here because as soon as it could, it's going to escape. That It's always looking for a way to leave the material world and it wants to go higher to its source. This is something, the, the Tani didn't introduce this idea. This comes from um, teachings of Kabbalah beforehand, but he spells it out this way. He says the neshama is the same way. Let's first read about the candle, then we'll go to the neshama. Kishem she'or haner misnanea tamid l'mayla betivoy. Just like the flame of a candle is always naturally going up. Why? Because the fire always wants to leave and depart from the wick. And to connect, to cleave to its source above. Af. Even though and let's think about this for a second. The flame goes up to its source. What, it becomes a big macher then? The flame goes up to its source, it's a nothing, it's a garnish. It leaves this world, it has no identity. It loses its identity the moment it leaves this world, this, the, 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 uh, the wick. But that's what it wants. It doesn't make sense, but that's what it wants. We, you know, if you could talk to the flame and say, where are you going? I just want to go to my source. But you realize if you go to your source, you won't be a candle. You won't be a flame anymore. I don't care. I want to go to my source. Get me out of here. That's what. That's really what the flame is saying when you look at a flame burning that way. The same is true with the neshama. If we would be able to have a conversation with the neshama, the neshama would say, please, please get me out of here. I don't want to be here. This material, physical world is trapping me down. I want to go to my source. I know if I go to my source, I won't be able to maybe be as productive as I am here in this world. I won't be able to burn and to be a flame, a candle. I want to go to my source. That's the neshama. 
That is what the, the Neshama wants. So when we speak about burning in a positive form, we speak about burning in our service of Hashem, it means that a Jew taps into their Neshama. Now, there are certain times that a person feels their neshama, and it does not in a, in a, here we're talking about a very extreme case, but it means is that we're able to feel this feeling of wanting to get closer to Hashem, and that's it that is important to us. For one person, maybe it's Yom Kippur. For another person, it's Rosh Hashanah. For another person, it's the night of the Seder. For another person, it's maybe a yard site or an event, or maybe sometimes they experience a uh, sort of a personal salvation then you know from in health or in whatever it is that makes them feel this closeness to Hashem and the halacha right away is even if it's kol shu, it's, it's a matter of quality not quantity when we feel this bond and this desire of wanting to get closer to Hashem and that is the only thing that interests us at that moment it's not about quantity how long did it last how many how many days a year? It's about the quality. Kolshu, even a little bit. Chayav, that's, that's a perfect flame. That's a that's a flame in serving Hashem. Comes the Rambam and says, beautiful, beautiful. You have a, you have a flame to connect to Hashem. There's a tenai, there's a condition. In order for this to be a true melacha, in order for this to be a true service of Hashem, it needs to produce ashes. You have to seek ashes from this flame. What's ashes? Ashes is the polar opposite, the extreme opposite of fire. In fact, the science of an of ashes, the Rambam, the uh, the Balatanya uh, brings us elsewhere in Tanya. I'm going to quote in a moment. Is that when when let's say you take a piece of wood and you burn it, you kindle it, it burns. What are the ashes? Is that the flame basically consumed all the water, and it consumed all the wind, all the oxygen, whatever inside this wood. And all that's left, it's the most coarse and physical material existence. Just the, just the earth is left. That's what ashes are. In other words, ashes represent the ultimate of material, physical being. Let me just read the words inside. They all are consumed and now they went up in smoke. Either way, the point is that what's left is the most coarse physical material existence. Tells us the Rambam, what's the halacha? If we feel a fire in wanting to get closer to Hashem, it must produce ashes meaning it must produce tangible results for us just to feel that we're getting closer to Hashem, but it doesn't change us physically. It doesn't change us in actuality, in Payal Mamish, that the next day is a better day, that our, our relationship with another person is better, that our involvement in material things are better. Then the fire is not a proper fire. It's not a real fire. The fire is only a real fire if it produces ashes, if it changes us in a, in a meaningful, tangible way, in a coarse way, I'm going to use that word because that's what we're talking about, in a very low way, if it's just a flame that we feel close to Hashem on these special occasions, let it be Yom Kippur, Shushana, the night of the Seder, or anything like that, and if it's, if it's just a flame without any ashes, the Rambam says, that, that's not the flame. That's not real fire. That's not what it means to serve Hashem. A real melacha, a real avoida, when it comes to serving Hashem, is a, a flame that produces ashes. Why? Why is that? Because we're here for a purpose. We're here in this world for a purpose. Our neshama was sent to this world for a purpose. What's the purpose? To make this world a, a dwelling place, a home. A place where, if you could use this term, Hashem should feel comfortable, meaning... That we take the we make the material physical world holy, make it godly. So if we're just being caught up in our flame, then we're missing our point. 
So it's very good to have a flame. It's a mavir kosher, even a little bit of a fire is high of, it's a good thing, meaning that's a proper flame. However, the ultimate flame is if you if it produces ashes, if it changes our every day. Because then we know that we're fulfilling the purpose, the purpose of why we're here. But this brings me to our final point. And I want to introduce this point with a little bit of a story. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of an anecdote. The Gemara tells us, Arba Nichnesu Lepardes. There were four individuals, and the Gemara lists the four names, that they entered the Pardes. What that means is that they went to, to study the deeper secrets of the Torah. If you want to know, translate then what we were learning here, is that they, they had a flame, they had a very strong flame. Ben Azai, Acher, these people, right? Ben Zayim, they, they, they had a very intense flame of being closer to Hashem. And the Gemara continues and says about each one of them how it had a terrible outcome. Except for Rabbi Akiva. It says, Rabbi Akiva, Nichnas B'Shalom V'Yatsa B'Shalom. He went in in peace and he left in peace. You know, in English, it sounds like he left in one piece, but that's not the piece I'm talking about. In the Shalom, in peace. He went in peacefully and he left peacefully. Now, if you think about it, those words, redundant, because everyone went in peacefully. question is how they left. Rabbi Kiba was the only one who left peacefully. So Hasidus tells us as follows. The difference between Rabbi Kiva and the others was not how they left, it was how they entered. Rabbi Kiva entered in a different way. Rabbi Kiva entered originally with the attitude and perspective of saying, I'm not getting high to get high. I'm not trying to burn just to burn. That There's no purpose to that. I am burning for the purpose of bringing it down to this world and changing the physical and the material world. Nikhlas B'Shalom, he went in with the right attitude, meaning to say as follows, this flame and ashes they're not contradictory. That on one hand, we need a neshama that's burning on a, like a flame. On the other hand, we have to cool it down by going down and changing the world. No, 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 no. Ultimately, the closer the neshama feels to Hashem, the higher the neshama is able to burn our neshama, our, our self, the lower we want to go. Because we know that Hashem's purpose for us is to bring godliness to this material, physical world. So the higher you go, the lower you're going, it's the same thing. It's not sort of countering each other. This is what Rabbi Kiva recognized. He said, Nichnas B'Shalom, he went in to this incredible high in the right attitude, the right perspective, knowing there's no purpose in a high if it's not for bringing it to a low. There's no purpose in a flame if it doesn't produce ashes. That is the only and, um, and only true form of a malacha of Avedis Hashem, of serving Hashem. Where we, we started off with Halacha and we ended up with with all of Yiddishkeit. But we put, let's let's do this, let's, let's trace it back. So we, we began with, with the Rambam. And we noticed in the Rambam that there's two ways of reading the Rambam. But we realized that whichever way you read the Rambam, you have to accept the following fact. And that is that the ultimate flame, according to the Rambam, la halacha, is when it produces ashes. Meaning, according to the opinion that the definition of burning on Shabbos is the consumption and destruction of wood, then it's obvious that ashes is, uh, is the ultimate flame. But the chiddush here is, the, the real kunz here, is that even according to the opinion, that the Rambam holds that the definition of the malacha, of the work on Shabbos of making a fire, is not about the consumption of wood, but about the flame itself. Even that reading in the Rambam leaves us saying that the Rambam holds that the ultimate flame, nevertheless, is a flame that produces ashes. And that's why he brings it as exhibit A, as his first example, when it comes to, when it comes to the malacha of burning. So why? Why is that the ultimate burning? So for that, we went into the nefesh of halacha, the nesham of the halacha. And we learned as follows. We learned that the, the 39 malachas 
are really mirroring 39 ways to serve Hashem. And in each halacha where we learn, where we learn that this is considered a form of work on Shabbos, we could trace it back and say, oh, because spiritually speaking, this represents a form of work in our service of Hashem. And you could do that with all 39 malachas. How do we apply that to burning? The neshama is burning and the neshama wants to get closer to Hashem. If we tap into that, if we feel that, then even a little bit, that's, that's a beautiful avoida in serving Hashem. A maver kosher, even a little bit chayav, that's a proper for flame. However, however, the ultimate flame is not a, just a flame. It's a flame that produces. And what does it produce? It produces ashes. It produces in the lowest material physical existence. Why? Because when we feel a flame to get closer to Hashem, it must translate that our, our every day is different. That our interactions with other people are different. Our interaction with the world is different. If it's just a flame and a, and a flame itself, that's not the point. We concluded by clarifying that idea to say that they're not contradicting each other, but rather they work hand in hand. Because ultimately, the higher a person and greater a person feels closer to Hashem, the more they feel that Hashem's purpose for us is to bring that holiness, bring that godliness here in a tangible way in this world. Shukayach, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining together tonight. And next week will be the last share before Pesach. And after Pesach, hopefully, we'll group together another time. We'll figure out when. But either way, um, I'm looking forward to Mirza Hashem to next week. And in the meantime, I want to wish everyone only gesund, good health, and we should only come together for happy things. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Rabbi Wabash. Good to see everyone.